Welcome to the Untold Tales Audio Anthologies. Written by Dr. Jeffrey A. Robinson and narrated by Melissa Del Toro Schaffner. Timely Warning August 13th, 2051 Arrecibo Radio Telescope, Puerto Rico On the evening of August 13th, 2051, everything changed. At 2 a.m., at the Arrecibo Radio Observatory, Dale Kristoff listened to music CDs when the signal arrived. As the mobile antenna slewed from one star to another in its scheduled monitoring of the heavens, the background static that always droned in the control room suddenly changed to a chirping sound. When the sound began, Dale smacked his CD player annoyingly and then hit it again. But the chirping didn't stop. It wasn't until he took off his headset to inspect the disc player that he realized that the sound emanated from the control room speakers. His jaw dropped as he realized it was an incoming transmission. Rushing to a console, he halted the movement of the radio telescope and noted the location where it pointed. Then, he frantically started up secondary and tertiary recording systems to capture the signal as he hastily logged a computer entry. Finally, he scrambled a thick three-ringed binder and began searching the SOP manuals for notification protocols that had never been used before, except in infrequently conducted drills. Within 40 minutes, three other SETI radio telescopes confirmed the incoming signals from the same region of space. The other four SETI stations were fixed ground facilities, which could not alter their antennas sufficiently to receive transmissions. Still, it was another hour before senior SETI technicians became actively involved, and people decided that the impossible might have actually occurred. No one recognized the message when it was first received, because no one expected it anymore. After all, it had been years since anyone had seriously listened to the stars. The decade of the 2040s had been difficult. The long-predicted shortage of fossil fuels had finally arrived, and while there was still oil available, the price of gasoline had skyrocketed to the point that only governments had any sufficient supply to use. The appearance of electric cars had resulted in the disappearance of virtually all internal combustion engines, and industries reorganized as the power industry adapted. Coal had replaced gasoline as the most common energy source, but it was used almost exclusively in power plants to generate electricity. Nuclear plants had a brief resurgence, but again, they only served to support the electric power grid. Still, such high-tech efforts were too little, too late. Biofuels barely broke even in energy generation, and solar and wind power generation still only constituted less than 5% of demand. Strict rationing of power remained the rule in most countries. The poorest ones suffered from frequent brownouts and blackouts, so that reliable electricity only existed for a few hours each day. Power was still available in plenty, but only to the rich, the powerful, and the privileged. Industries collapsed and economies tumbled. Nations fell and rose as the lifestyle changed and governments struggled to adapt. The Greatest Recession since the 1930s held the world in its grip. Famines and riots erupted in many places around the world. Those countries hardest hit inevitably suffered internecine conflicts or civil war. As most nations simply fought to maintain infrastructures that could simply grow and distribute food, a no-frills policy regarding science and technology strangled the space program and scientific research. In this grim new world, pure research was all but forgotten. The space program had been abandoned for nearly a decade. A single long-term colony on Mars lingered on. Its inhabitants stranded there for more than seven years. Promises to launch a final expedition to return them to Earth were occasionally voiced, but funding never passed the legislature. Like the inhabitants of Earth, the Mars colonists struggled to survive. 
Only the United States and China still possessed satellite launch capabilities, but no one dared authorize their use. The SETI program, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, had lost most of its funding during the energy crunch and had limped along ever since on private and corporate donations. Eventually, however, even those monies disappeared. In its final scheduled year of operation, SETI had only seven facilities still capable of watching the starlit skies and listening at the silent static of space. Even at those few remaining sites, the staff consisted exclusively of unpaid volunteers. However, this message changed it all. The signal originated from a region of space where there was no star. Calculations triangulated on a position about 500 astronomical units away from Earth. The signal was digital, but the binary information was encoded in broadband RF packets. It contained a 20-minute message, which repeated itself over and over again. Between the messages was a series of bits that changed with each retransmission. The string of bits decreased each time the message was repeated. By the time the technicians realized the bit string was changing with each repetition, the count of bits was down to 59. After the next cycle, the number was 58. Whatever the message was, it was accompanied by a countdown that would finish in 19 hours. While everyone waited, no one dared conjecture what would happen at the end of the 19-hour countdown. In the meantime, different teams worked on the main message, and it wasn't long before someone recognized it. The binary-coded message was identical to that of the 1977 Voyager spacecraft, launched more than 60 years before. It was the most famous message ever developed and had been intended as an attempt to establish communications with extraterrestrials should its contents ever be discovered. Arguments immediately broke out amongst the technicians, most insisting the transmission was a hoax. The Voyager wasn't scheduled to reach another solar system for more than 11,000 years. The only races that could possibly know about it were those on Earth. Besides, the message was coming from the wrong direction, to be the Voyager. Eventually, everyone agreed the message was meant to attract attention, and it had certainly done that. As everyone waited for the countdown to continue, the four SETI stations receiving the signal grew crowded with representatives from various national and UN organizations. Dale waited anxiously as the countdown reached its end and the slow countdown finally stopped. Holding his breath as silence replaced the chirping sounds from the control room speakers, he waited for a few agonizing seconds of static as a new sequence of digital information was received. This message, however, was different than anyone expected, and it possessed an entirely different structure. It lasted for ten minutes and then stopped. It was not repeated. When it finished, technicians scrambled to analyze their recordings, most expecting some sort of April Fool's joke. The research team at the Old Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California was the first to recognize the pattern of the final portion of the communication. The transmission was similar to recently established digital ultra-high-density television transmissions, but the audio sidebands were multiplexed differently. Long before the picture and sound were deciphered, everyone agreed that the message had to have originated from Earth. It would have been an impossible coincidence for an alien species to independently develop UHD-TV protocols, which were only two years old. Still, no one expected the message, which the different teams finally pieced together. Dale was privileged to hear one of the first reconstructions of the message, the playback appeared as a high-quality TV signal, which everyone viewed on the control room monitors. The TV screen flickered, and Dale found himself staring at a middle-aged man with a scraggly beard and sunken, hollow eyes. The man said, To anyone who receives this transmission, I bring you an important message from the year 2129, nearly 80 years in your future. My name is Jason McIntosh, and I was born in 2094 as one of the last generation 
of those trapped at the Mars colony. This message is being sent to what we hope is the past, specifically the year 2051. Unfortunately, none of us here will ever know if this transmission is actually received. In our timeline, it was not. Dr. Jagdish Singh, our chief scientist, insists the structure of time is malleable and fluid. He believes we can successfully alter our past. Our attempts to do so, however, are born of last-minute desperation, since those of us remaining alive here at the colony are dying, and we only have a few months left to live. We're sending two important pieces of news that you must believe. The first regards an event which will happen in less than two days of your days. The second is about something else, which will occur in a little over 45 years. We pick this day and year to send our message to prove that this transmission is real, so you'll believe the second part of our message and heed its warning. If you ignore the first, Earth will be harmed terribly. If you do not heed the second, Earth will be destroyed. In just under 48 hours, a star relatively close to our solar system will go nova. This explosion will be totally unexpected and will be of unprecedented magnitude. The star is in the constellation Erendis, less than 30 light years away. For a brief period of time, the light from this supernova will be far brighter than the sun. It will cripple global communications and wreak havoc with satellites, radio, and television. Only land-based and optical fiber communications will remain functional. In our timeline, Earth was unprepared for this. The new star in the sky caused chaos. Global communication systems collapsed, and thousands died in the riots and the panic that followed. Governments weren't able to reestablish their communication systems until too late. World governments, which already tottered on the edge of collapse, succumbed to a worldwide recession from which they never completely recovered. Now, we don't expect you to believe us right now. But if you act quickly and notify the general populace, you can minimize the damage which will result and prepare yourself for a more terrible disaster that will occur in another four and a half decades. If you don't, all life on Earth will perish. In our past, years which are still in your future, the decades following the Nova were bleak. The people of Earth withdrew from the stars and turned their eyes to their own problems. My parents, part of the original Mars colonists, reconciled themselves to a life of hardship, since they were stranded here with no hope of return. They survived, but they too isolated themselves and ignored the squabbles and petty little wars back on Earth. Near the end, they hardly even communicated Earthside anymore. Here at the colony, we had problems of our own, just staying alive. In the spring of the year 2096, a fleet of ships approached Earth. These ships appeared to flee the same supernova you will witness in a day or two. Whether the ships were from a civilization which orbited that star, or whether they inhabited another system nearby, we never determined. Earth witnessed their arrival, but had long since lost any ability to return to space. The race, as we came to call them, settled into an orbit around the Earth, just beyond the moon. But they never responded to Earth's attempts to communicate. Instead, they methodically and systematically destroyed all probes launched to investigate them. The fleet consisted of nine huge craft, each more than two miles long and more than 50 smaller support vessels. They parked high overhead and seemed to ignore us. Everyone assumed they were just watchers, observing and learning about us. It wasn't until the bombardment began that we discovered how wrong we had been. During the year that the race had spent passively circling our planet, 
their support ships had herded asteroids from beyond Earth's orbit. In late 2097, they started dropping these asteroids on the planet. Many of them were a quarter to a half mile across and impacted with devastating results. Those of us trapped at the Mars colony watched in horror as thousands of explosions detonated on the Earth's surface. Only a few actually hit cities, but they didn't need to. Each projectile landed with energy of dozens of nuclear bombs. Watching Earth night skies through telescopes, we often witnessed as many as a hundred explosions detonate each day. Our estimates are that over the following year, nearly 15,000 meteors struck the Earth's surface. My parents watched helplessly as the Earth slowly changed from a beautiful globe of blue and white to one of ruddy brown and gray. The dust raised by the impacts darkened the skies in a nuclear winter of apocalyptic proportions. The last radio signals from Earth verified that the sun was no longer visible and that temperatures had plunged far below freezing, even in tropical regions. The raining dust and bitter cold killed everyone and everything alive. Those who huddled in buried shelters slowly starved or froze. Our colony maintained radio silence, hoping someone on Earth would survive. But we've heard no evidence of life there since the year 2101, nearly 30 years ago. Whoever they are, the aliens of the race are very patient. After destroying all life on Earth, they waited for decades before acting again. Finally, in 2111, they acted again, launching millions of unmanned craft into Earth's upper atmosphere. While we are too far to directly observe them, we speculate that these craft fly endlessly through the Earth's upper atmosphere, drawing in dust, squeezing it into pellets, and then dropping the bits of dirt down to the surface. Working slowly, they perform their tasks flawlessly. In a mere five years, the Earth's air cleared, and the race descended to claim the empty planet. Now, from telescopes here at the colony, we can see faint lights from the night side of Earth. The race has built their own cities to replace those of ours that they destroyed. They exterminated our species and took our world as theirs. We now surmise that the race fled their home system due to the Nova and Epsilon Arendi taking years to reach Earth. Earth is no longer inhabited by our species. The race has taken the world as their own. This is the warning we bring you. You must prepare for that day. Watch the heavens and be ready. Otherwise, all of you will die. The voice of the bearded man in the image trembled, and he appeared ready to break into tears. During the years that the few of us here at the Mars colony remained in hiding, we always hoped we'd be the seed from which humanity could rise again. Unfortunately, that's no longer an option. But our colony was never intended to be permanent. When the space program abandoned the colony in mid-2064, my grandparents and their companions had no option but to find some way to survive on their own. Our power supply consisted of a small nuclear reactor from the ship that brought us here. We managed to build greenhouses, and we found sources of frozen water beneath the ground. We persevered, but as equipment and parts wore out, there were no replacements. An increasing number of systems failed over the years. But we managed to hang on. Two months ago, there was a failure in the coolant system of our reactor. We fixed it, but not before we all received a lethal dose of radiation poisoning. Some of us have already died. The rest of us will die in three or 
four more months. For us, there is no hope. Dr. Singh is the one who thought of sending this message to our own past to try to change the events that doomed us. He conceived of a way of using supercooled cesium to make a Bose-Einstein condensate that is so close to absolute zero that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle causes the atom's locations to become diffused and fuzzy. At about a millionth of a degree Kelvin, all the atoms overlap and the condensate forms. Within this volume, the speed of light slows to a few meters per second, and Dr. Singh conjectured that tachins would slow as well. When tachins, however, drop below the speed of light, in what he calls induced tachyon delay, they appear in our universe as normal photons displaced in time. That's how we're sending you this message nearly 80 years into our own past. We've managed to generate pulses of tachins using our nuclear reactor by sending them through a lens-shaped droplet of condensate. In doing so, we hope to create photons far in our past that someone will receive. If our calculations are correct, our message should appear in the year 2051. If our theory is wrong, no one will hear us, but then. We're already dead anyway. If you receive this message, please listen. Prepare for that fleet, or no one will survive. Dale watched in horror as the image shook and wavered. A low thunderous rumble sounded, and the gaunt frail man in the image turned to someone off screen and whispered. Then he turned back to the camera and said, one thing I didn't mention. While we stayed hidden from the race for more than 23 years, sending this transmission has revealed our existence to them. You see, only a small fraction of the photons we create by tacking delay are displaced in time. Some go backwards in time, some go forwards, but most reappear locally. In the many hours we've spent transmitting, we've essentially been announcing our location to our alien conquerors like a beacon in the night. We knew they'd respond, but they appeared to be more efficient than we expected. Someone off-screen interrupted him once more, but it was impossible to hear what was said. Turning back toward the camera, the stranger continued. I've just received word that the aliens have dropped into near-Mars orbit and are beginning a small bombardment of asteroids here, just like they did to destroy Earth. We don't have long before they land one nearby. A look of desperation shadowed the man's face. Please listen to this warning, he said, leaning closer to the camera. This is not a fake. It is not a hoax. Look to the heavens and watch for the star that will herald the doom of mankind. Prepare for the invasion that will come in forty years. There was another loud rumble, and the image wavered as shockwaves shook the camera. Terror gripped the gaunt scientist. Please, he shouted. Please be ready. We... The transmission ended abruptly. Dale sat shocked and stunned. No one spoke for several seconds. Everyone just stared at one another. After a long and awkward silence, someone said, Oh my God. Someone else countered with a, You've got to be kidding. Then everyone started talking at once and arguing. Some claimed it was true. Others claimed it was a spectacular fraud. Within hours, copies of the message had been leaked to the press, and it was carried on all public television channels. While no one in the scientific community spoke up, and no one officially said they thought the transmission was real, most people took a wait-and-see attitude and watched the skies to see if the prediction about the Nova was true. Even Ben Sorensen, the SETI director, was cautious and non-committal. Only a few cult-like groups affiliated with UFO fringe groups believed the message wholeheartedly. Nonetheless, everyone watched the night skies and the major governments of Earth took cautionary actions, just in case. While people waited anxiously, someone did a calculation and figured out where the Earth would be in 80 years. Since the sun was moving toward the star Vega at a rate of about 8 miles per second, 
The Earth eight decades in the future would be somewhere in the constellation Lyra, exactly where the mysterious message appeared to originate from. Still, this evidence was not considered conclusive proof of the transmission's authenticity. Then, two nights later, just as the man in the message had predicted, a star in the rambling constellation Erandius flared and grew. It was a supernova, the closest ever to occur in recorded history. It steadily grew in brightness until it outshined the sun. For part of each day, people standing outside possessed two shadows. Every communication satellite in orbit ceased functioning. The ionization of the Earth's upper atmosphere was so great that all television, radio, and cell phone communication was interrupted. The radiation from the star was so intense that the aurora borealis grew until it was visible near the equator. The night sky burned with waves of liquid fire that washed across the heavens from one horizon to the other. While the radiation wreaked havoc with space-based installations, the Earth's atmosphere shielded people on the surface from most of the damaging high-energy rays. Those that stayed indoors received little more radiation than the average dental X-ray. But many in third-world countries suffered severe radiation burns. Scientists initially expressed surprise that the blue giant had gone nova so unexpectedly. Telescopic analysis, however, revealed that a small, massive body, probably a neuron star, had drifted too close to the giant, drawn mass from it, and destabilized its core, triggering its spectacular and premature demise. Within a week, the star's intensity subsided. It gradually dimmed and, within a few months, had faded from sight. Before it vanished, however, the nations of the Earth had already joined together and mobilized. They had a common enemy, and the troubles they faced seemed tiny in comparison to what loomed four decades away. United by a common cause, they made preparations for the arrival of an alien fleet that was likely already well on its way to Earth. With a grim resolve, the countries of Earth prepared for a war, which would determine the fate of the human race. September 7, 2092, Earth Space Command, Space Station Archimedes. Brigadier General Dale Kristoff sat at his desk reviewing reports on the latest shipments launched from Earth's surface. The land-based magnetic catapults launched thousands of tons of refined materials up to the construction docks in near-Earth orbit every day, and it was his job to make sure it all moved smoothly and on schedule. The UN space fleet now numbered more than a thousand ships, and the logistics of keeping hundreds of thousands of men fed and supplied were tremendous. Dale, however, was very good at his job. After all, he'd been working in the United Nations Space Alliance since it began back in 2053. At 61, he held a position of great prestige in the Alliance Space Command. Halfway through the day, his adjutant interrupted him. The captain serving his tour at the space station before rotating on to his first command, a ship of the line, which was still under construction, approached and handed him a message tube. Excuse me, sir, said his aide. One of today's launch canisters contained this personal message packet for you. Dale's eyebrows furrowed. It was rare that communications were sent in physical form. Most messages were transmitted electronically. Returning the captain's salute, he turned his attention to the packet. As his aide departed, Dale opened the metal cylinder, but didn't recognize the sender, and found it was from the executor of the estate of someone who had recently died Earthside. His eyes widened when he found a sealed letter from Ben Sorensen, the former head of the SETI program back when the warning from the future had been received. Thinking back, the last he remembered of the old man was when he'd resigned from SETI after the UN took over the remaining radio telescope observatories. He had somehow managed to avoid taking credit for the timely warning and disappeared into obscurity, eschewing public life and the notoriety he had deserved. Brigadier General Dale Kristoff opened the sealed envelope and after a few moments struggled with his conscience as he found himself reading a deathbed confession.
Ben Sorensen had sent Dale a detailed explanation that the original alien message was a fake. The entire incident had been an elaborate hoax masterminded by him and two technicians on the SETI staff. By Ben's account, the Earth in those times was so wrapped up with its own problems that it had lost focus. Growing pessimism had triggered a depression, and the world's economies were spiraling down out of control. Ben feared another dark ages would result and came up with a plan. Working with two friends, he outlined the mechanics of faking a message, which they planned to pretend came from another star. Then, an unexpected opportunity presented itself that changed their plans. Amongst SETI's few remaining resources, Ben had inherited the stewardship of three abandoned neutrino detectors stationed at different locations near Earth's equator. Once, there had been plans to use these to supplement Earth's search for evidence of other extraterrestrial civilizations, but there had never been sufficient funding to do so. The detectors were too expensive to maintain. Buried deep below the Earth's surface and shielded from electromagnetic radiation and cosmic rays, these huge vats of photosensitive liquids detected a few incredibly rare interactions of neutrinos with solid matter. The most that they had ever managed to measure were periodic fluctuations of nuclear reactions deep within the sun, which seemed to be precursors to solar flares. The three installations had long since been abandoned by the scientific organizations that had built them. The monitoring of these detectors was relegated to remote telemetry recorders at a SETI site in Effelsburg, Germany, near Bonn. As Ben Sorensen and his accomplices were working out the final details of their fictitious message, the three neutrino detectors flared with unexpected activity. Ben recognized that the burst of neutrinos represented an unprecedented increase in nuclear activity. Since the sun seemed normal, he surmised that the sudden increase in neutrino density must be the first wave front from an exploding star somewhere close by. Struggling to recall nearly forgotten theories of astronomical physics, Ben recalled that such a neutrino flux would occur just before stars went nova. As stars collapse, entirely new thermonuclear processes suddenly occur, which generate an enormous number of neutrinos. Indeed, these nuclear processes are what cause the incredibly violent explosions, which turn dying stars into the brief, spectacular bursts of radiation that are supernovas. Over the next several hours, as the Earth turned on its axis, Ben Sorensen used the three receivers to triangulate on the point in the heavens where the neutrino burst originated. He knew, from theory at least, that the wave front of neutrinos would precede the visible light from the dying star by three or four days. With frantic haste, he and his team changed the fake message they had prepared and altered it to take advantage of this unexpected event. Together, the three scientists altered their transmission to be a message from the future instead. Quickly drafting up a script, they videotaped the message and even managed to alter the UHDTV recording a little to match changes in transmission protocols that might occur over the intervening years. It was easy to fake the signals. They had already planted small transmitters near the four directable radio telescopes under SETI's control. Ben's team remotely monitored the positions of the antennas and turned on the extremely low-power radio transmitters when they were aimed in the right directions. The ruse wasn't perfect, but it was good enough to fool the experts on the SETI staff. To his surprise, their trick worked better than expected. Their guess about the supernova proved correct and added credence to the message's claims. The lie about an invading alien fleet gained credibility, and the threat of impending doom rallied the world's governments into action. Despite the scattered riots and brief panic that followed, the near-universal belief in the warning from Earth's future united the world and gave it purpose. In a few short years, the entire planet was on a war footing. 
funding for scientific research and the expansion into space was renewed with frantic fervor. Somehow, the three conspirators managed to keep their secret. After the other two died, Ben, the sole survivor, felt the need to pass the truth along to someone else. He had prepared this account and left it to be sent to Dale Kristoff upon Ben's death. Dale lowered the letter. For years, he and others high in the UN Space Command had suspected the message from the future had been a fake. Despite efforts to duplicate the experiments described in the original message, no one had ever managed to replicate the techniques to send messages across time. Research, however, had resulted in a means of faster-than-light travel, which remained highly classified. While unsuitable for transporting human passengers, numerous FTL probes had been built and launched in recent years. The military had planned to use this new technology to destroy the approaching alien fleet before it reached Earth. But despite all their efforts, the UN Space Alliance could not locate any invading ships. Only recently had the command staff concluded that there was no fleet and that the message had been a hoax. Finally, after careful and considered debate, the most senior members of the Alliance decided to suppress this information. The alien fleet was not due to arrive for another five years, and the economies of Earth thrived as last final preparations were made for the approaching invaders. More and more ships were built, and greater scientific advances were still being made as everyone prepared for the aliens' arrival. Dale carefully folded Ben Sorensen's deathbed confession and dropped it into a disposal, instantly reducing it to ash. The hoax had succeeded beyond the old SETI chief's wildest dreams. The fabricated story had rallied the world's nations and turned Earth's growing despair into purposeful endeavor. People's belief in the message from the future had provided badly needed direction to a world that had lost its focus. United by the threat of a common enemy, nations had set their differences aside to survive the threat of an unseen enemy. Worry and doubt had been displaced by patriotism, dedication, and drive that made even average citizens heroes. The lie was so universally believed and so unquestioningly accepted that Dale knew publishing this account would be political suicide. Any such claim would result in the immediate condemnation of anyone stupid enough to espouse it. Someday, people would realize there was no approaching alien fleet. But that time was years away. In the meantime, humanity had a common goal, and it drew them all to the stars. Who knows, Dale thought. Maybe I'll pass the truth along to someone before I die. Years after the alien fleet fails to show up, the world might be open to accepting the truth. But it's not something they'd be willing to hear today. Dale turned once more to the reports and requisitions that lay before him and awaited his signature. As he dutifully signed them, he smiled silently. If people weren't willing to hear the truth, he was more than content to let them live the lie. Thank you for listening. We love our listeners, fans, and patrons. If you loved what you heard, please like and subscribe to our audio anthology. And consider visiting our Patreon site at www.patreon.com forward slash Melissa Del Toro voiceover. If you'd like to read more of the stories in the Untold Tales series, not narrated here on our podcast, you can find Jeff's books on Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle format. The links for all of this information are conveniently listed in this episode's show notes. Thank you and have a wonderful day.